All right, checking the camera here. I'm gonna do this webcam style. This is gonna be a Q&A, which I'm assuming most people will just listen to, hence the webcam recording and not the other camera. Also because I can record forever and I don't have my limits here on the camera. As always with those Q and A's, I'm gonna read the question in full, just in case you're listening, you don't, you don't read the questions, which I'm gonna put it on the screen. And I am going to answer preform whatever I think. You can always take whatever you want from those uh, answers and disregard whatever you want. But I'm gonna start at the bottom here. Shalom is asking, hi JD, what's the best way to use a walk cycle and have the character take a curve and stop? How would you go about it? That's a good question. If you have the tools and sometimes some of them you have to pay for, um, there is a walk path tool. So you can basically put your walk cycle on a path. The path can have a curve and then the feet won't slide. It's going to be a, it's an automated thing where it can, you can curve, you can even lean into it. Depends on the tool. I actually do want to look at those tools uh, and obviously do a couple of reviews of these because I'm going to use, I want to use the tools myself. Now, if you don't have a path tool, then it would be, you can either constrain your feet on the turn where you have your cycle and then as they turn, you don't want the feet to slide, obviously. So you're going to have your roots turn on an animation layer and then you can just constrain the feet for those couple moments or frame by frame, um, have them stick to the floor. Um, but that is the extent of my answer. But I've seen something just recently that, that did just that and I don't remember if it was animation layers. I can look for it and you can see in the description if I find it, it's going to be in there. And if not, it's not going to be in there. Um, and then the stop would just be, you have to, I would at the end bake out everything when you're done and you're happy with it. Because then you can add some variations in the cycle so it doesn't look like a cycle. And then I would just hand animate the stop. It would just be transition from a cycle to a, you know, straightforward post to post, whatever you want. Straight ahead, not straightforward, but whatever transition you have from that cycle to an actual animation. Um, that's what I would do. It's a good question though, but I feel like that warrants a deeper dive that might go into an FNA or review uh, in terms of cycles and stuff like that. Parth Sonagra, Sonagra, I think so, is asking, I'm 19 years old and studying in finance and studying finance, okay? I want to become an animator, but don't have enough money for animation studies. So I'm thinking to get a job and then to study for animation. Should I do that? Or study animation only, not during graduation, and what's the maximum age to become an animator? So I'm gonna start backwards. There is no maximum age to become an animator. That being said, it's not like you're seeing 70 year old animators at a company or starting out. There's, there's also a certain amount of energy involved. I think these, that question has been asked in previous Q and A's in terms of how old can you be as an animator? You know, it's, I wouldn't say it's a young people's game. It definitely helps to be young because you have the, you have the energy to stay the, you know, at, at a job for a longer period of time or switch, switch cities or countries, work long hours. I think it's just, there's a certain energy demanded of you physically and mentally to do that. Um, I don't like to put a maximum age on there because I think, you know, if you're doing great work and you can follow along and you're productive at a company, that shouldn't really be a limit. But, you know, you, you're, you're diving into the ageism type of thing and, and do people want to hire older people? Because older people, I'm generalizing, they might have a family or just other responsibilities. So they might have to leave at a certain time of the day and they can't just stay longer willy nilly. And maybe younger people, they can just stay and hopefully not work for free, but they're just maybe a bit more flexible in terms of the schedule. So maybe that's also why younger people uh, are favored. But you know, uh, that's that would be my, my broader answer there. Now, the other question kind of depends. I mean, it's very it's very specific to you. You want to be an animator, you don't have enough money for animation study. So it's definitely wise what you're saying here, get a job, save up, and then use that to study animation. Or you're saying here, study animation only and not graduating, maybe, you know, doing stuff online, um, you know, cheap workshops, or finding, you know, there's a bunch of tutorials obviously on YouTube as you're watching this on YouTube. So it really depends what you want to do. I mean, I am biased because I teach an animation mentor and I like that community and, and you know, the, the mentors are great, the exercises are cool. And I think there's there's something that you're gonna get out of an online school, whatever you're gonna choose, because it has a curriculum, it has a schedule and it's guided and you get feedback versus learning from home by yourself. There's always gonna be a limit when you're alone in terms of feedback and when you're gonna get out of things. It's always a bit easier when someone is guiding you. So, and then, then it just depends, you know, are you that disciplined to do stuff alone at home or wherever you're going to do it, right? 
but can you just study have the critical eye maybe check online ask some people for, for feedback and then continue are you that disciplined or are you someone that needs a schedule and deadlines and 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 broader you know mentors and teachers yeah, so i'm not i can't really answer your question i think they're both valid depending on what you prefer what you're better at you know what i mean because you can always just like you said work save up money and then do a hard switch to not have that money now i'm going to use that and whatever i have to you know pay the bills and go through formal studies so i'm mean, going to leave it at that Nimek Martin is asking here, as a traditional 2D anime, what should I put in my real portfolio? I believe I asked that I can't answer that because I'm not a 2D animator. Um, you know, the usual would be the best shot first, and then depending on the project, something that's appropriate for that project. It's character-based, effects-based, uh, you know, like something with camera, without camera. Um, so yeah, that's my extent. So I'm not versed into the current tra traditional 2D animator uh, demo reel. It's the usual is you know the character has to just be alive and think and um it has to be a performance unless again you're going for something more effects or robotic or action you just again it just kind of depends what you want to do and where you want to apply and what they are looking for the broad answer would just be look at the company you want to work for look at their portfolio what have they done and then that will tell you that's what they do i should do something that fits that so that when they look at your reel they go oh you're doing what we're doing we can hire you that's a broad answer um pucifer 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 cg it's one of those things where i got to read the names and apologize for butchering all of these how are the chances and situations for a company to relocate offer to an animator okay i'm assuming you're asking are they going to uh pay for the relocation of an animator that can happen uh i'm, I'm not going to say all the time depends on the company depends on the budget depends you know how much they want you uh and i'm not familiar with the current landscape of companies what they're doing in terms of finances and budget and and stuff like that especially nowadays since a lot is remote and hopefully stays at least the option stays to be remote i hope that also works i'm looking at the camera here i'm not used to it. i'm usually looking here anyway um so i would say it really depends on the company it depends on the budget and depends on how good you are in terms of you know they really really want you so they're going to pay for that it might just be a flight it might be a flight or whatever transportation and then three months of housing potentially it really depends on the company what i would do is ask i would ask around google around you know maybe there's some documentation online about that and if you are in a in a conversation with the company you just have to ask i mean the interview is always uh, two-sided right they're going to ask you a bunch of questions and then you're going to have a bunch of questions so you know what is your the typical interview questions but on top of that would be my dog coming in right there uh yeah you would ask the company questions including relocation okay i'm gonna pause this i'm gonna close the door and i'll be back all right doggy is settled uh, of course on the most comfortable you know blanky type of thing all right let's continue with there's an answer there okay so jack donton i'm assuming Hi, JD. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you, too. How long did it take you to be confident with your craft? <laughs> I got a cough and I'll have a glass of water. It's not whiskey. Um, it takes a long time and I'm still not confident. How about that? I am generally confident in terms of technique. There I say. Like when I see something technical, even if it's super complicated, there's always going to be something in terms of finding reference online, you doing your uh, reference yourself, feedback in dailies, whatever. There's always going to be a way to get something done technically. I think my confidence is always in terms of ideas and creativity and just performance because that's something very specific. It has to be original and something you have never seen before and all that good stuff. I think that's always going to be a challenge and I don't know if I'm always going to be um, not confident <laughs> in that. It's always, a, it's always a struggle. For me, it's always kind of like, I have great ideas, subjectively, right? And then I start a shot, and I feel like, no, those are not great ideas. And it's always kind of that beginning is going to be awesome, and then you work on it, you're like, mm, I don't know. And then it continues with feedback, and at the end, it ends up being at least okay, and sometimes cool. Um, so yeah, won't really help you, right? You're probably going to, well, I don't know, it took two years. Two years, and then I was confident it was just fine. You're going to be just fine, too. 
you know, it really depends also on your, on, on, you know, how you are and, and your goals and your wins and your, your achievements and how that will fuel your confidence. So yeah, technically I'm, I'm fairly okay. I know that something like if there's something crazy, you know, creaturey acting camera combined something I'm going to go, okay, this is going to be complicated, but I think I've done it long enough to where I can go. Okay, this is complicated. It's going to be a pain, but I can deconstruct it into let's do this first. Let's do that. Let's do the camera. Let's do this. And then get to a point where like, that's, not, that's pretty cool. And then go back into it. More. Okay, well, how, how can I make it cooler in terms of the creativity and the ideas? That's kind of where I'm at. I feel like that point where doing what you have in mind is no longer a problem. And it's all about the ideas and small things. Yeah, you know, personally, I still struggle with that. I Like I just said, I have stuff in my head because I don't thumbnail. I just think about it and I visualize it. Like, oh, that's going to be cool. And in my mind, it's cool. And then when you start, uh, it's always, I still struggle with that going, well, I thought it's going to be awesome. I know the movement. I even did some reference. Like, I have all the material. And I look at my animation like, this doesn't compare. Or you can even use like an existing shop that someone did, TV, movies, whatever. And you're copying it just for practice uh, practice purposes. And you go, no, that doesn't look the same at all. It looks like crap. Why? I know what to do, but I can't make it work. That's I'm still struggling with that. There I say. I'm a junior animator and in school I was, I was fantasizing that state at the end of my program. At the end of it, I was expecting it to be after a few times in my first job. Okay. Now that time has passed and I still don't see when that state of confidence will come. It might take a while. Every time I start a new shot, I don't know how I would go through it. So far, so good, but it's frustrating at some point. It is. I totally agree. Hold on. There's a read more. Okay. And then uh, M. Edson replied, I really like this question. I was just thinking the same today. Working on a shot, I know what I have in mind, but it's hard to get it on the computer. Totally agree. From my lack of technical skills. Yes, me too. I was thinking how great it will be when I can create without being bogged down by my lack of understanding. Again, um, I think I think all of you, both of you wrote this and people watching this and listening, you will get to a point where technically you're going to be okay. I mean, I, you know, I still have to check my arcs and pops and things and weight and balance. It's just, it's just that's just a constant thing. But I'm definitely better than I was, you know, what, 18 years ago. <laughs> but like I said, it's the, the creativity aspect is, is where my confidence goes way down where I got to try a bunch of stuff and I see my dog is leaving. My, my dog is bored of this Q&A and it's going to start whining. I'm going to wait until he starts whining. I'm going to go back and open the door. Anyway, so I think for both of you, it's going to take a while. And while it could be weeks, months, years, it really depends on what you do. What I would recommend is that you do, if you don't do enough at work, that's different. I know it's more work after work, but this is how it goes. You practice during the week or on weekends, smaller stuff. And you, you make a list of, I'm not good at this, 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 and this. And then you go and practice that. And keep it short, two or three seconds, right? Nothing long where you get overwhelmed. Keep it short, do those exercises. Because the more you've done, the more confident you're going to be that you can do it again. And the more you've done it, the better you're going to be at it and faster. And it, once you've covered a wide range of technical things and mechanics and stuff, when you get a new shot, you can go, okay, I've never done this. But this is a combination of this, this, and this, which I've done before. I think I can do this. I think that's for me how I have um, grown my uh, confidence. There I say. All right. Kaylee Jacobs has a question here. I don't know if you have something like this already, but I know you have workshops of 16 submissions for $500. But if you if you're in a lower budget, that's a lot of money to come up with. Would you consider maybe a smaller shop that's more budget friendly? For instance, eight submissions for 250 or if someone just wants feedback for something once, maybe $32 per shot. Basically, the quick um, answer to that is, would I consider smaller workshops for half the price or on a per review basis? I thought about it. Maybe um, on, what I sometimes do is if they don't have the $4.99 up front, they can do eight weeks and then eight weeks later. So they pay basically in two installments. I don't shorten. I don't often shorten um, workshops to just eight weeks. Um, and I definitely don't do on a per shop basis because it's the hassle, the fees. Um, I don't know, like so far I've kept it as one chunk, but I'm always reevaluating and um, you never know. That could be something to consider in the future for sure. Harry Papa. 
Harry Papa is asking. Hello, JD. I want to start by saying that I really appreciate all the work you've put into this channel and into helping young animators. You're very welcome. Thanks for watching my stuff. I am an international animation student at AAU, just like me. I used to be just drop my pen. Going down the same road as you did back when you came to the US. So my question for you is, can you share some of your experiences as an international going to the industry, dealing with visas and getting your job at ILM? I have answered that in a couple Q and A's before. Feel free to watch some of these, or I have a couple interviews where I talk about that. Um, so I'm gonna keep it short, also because it's been so long. So basically, I got to the states in fall '99 for the academy. So as we said, academy, and uh, they provide obviously the student visa. And then after three and a half years, I graduated in May 2003, and that gave me one year of OPT. But back then, there was no deadline. I didn't have to find something within 90 days, which just you got a year. And then within that year, I worked on stuff. Um, I set my reels out, didn't do anything. And I heard my dog whining. And then I went back to school for one more semester, got a new reel together, sent it out. And I got hired at ILM in January 2004. And they then took care of the visa. That was basically it. And back then, it was an H-1B that was valid for four years. And after that, they would have re hopefully, you know, still interested in me, uh, would have done another four year visa. I think, again, I'm completely out of the loop. I don't know. I think last I heard, this was years ago, that you don't have two H1Bs. You only have one and it's five years instead of four. I really don't know the current landscape. So unfortunately, you're going to have to research that. And um, and that's, that's basically that. I mean, after four years, I found my lovely wife. We met at the Academy. And I got married, and then that's my status as a, with a green card in this in this country. So that's really the short of it. Um, but there are other ways of getting sponsored. The company can sponsor you, but it's again, I'm old, and it's been a long time. So what I would do is research, ask the company if you're in, comp in contact with them, or go online, whatever country you are. Uh, I mean, it sounds like your uh, academy, so in, it's in the states. I would check the latest guidelines in terms of um, what the requirements are. Let me get the dog out. Ooh, let the dogs out. All right. I can check when it's 18 minutes. That's not too bad. Not too bad. All right. Sudhir, Piyush, Piyush Sudhir. Sorry about those names. How should one look at rejections or second time applying for a company? What should be in a second demo reel as first has given an expression of my work? Okay. Well, first, how should you look at rejection? You know, rejections... They come in all kinds of shapes and sizes in terms of your work is not good enough. They just that you have no place right now. Uh, your your reel was awesome, but they are done hiring. They filled all the spots. Your reel is awesome. You've worked before, and you're too expensive, and they can't hire you. You have a great reel, but you're a foreigner, and the visa process is not working out. Too expensive, maybe uh, immigration stuff could be an issue. There's just so many, so many reasons out of your control in terms of rejections. And in terms of a new reel, if you're sending it to a new company, I would just do a whole brand new reel. Maybe except one, one shot. Because you don't want to have, you know, whatever, seven shots and then only one is new. And then that's what you can send in. So maybe keep your very best one of your first reel. Put that in the middle of the shot and then do a brand new reel for the rest. I would do a whole brand new reel completely. But, you know, sometimes your shot is really, really good. Maybe the rest wasn't good and that brought the whole impression down. So maybe keep you very, the one you have for, for at the beginning. The very first best one, put that in the middle somewhere. Or maybe at the end of the new reel. That would be my uh, my answer. Tony Cashman, the insightful. <laughs> That's a great name. Hello again, JD. I'm one of the commentators on some of your acting for analysis videos. Thanks for watching. Have participated in a couple hundred frame contests here and there and watched some other videos of yours. Well, thank you. That's very thorough. For the most part, I'm honestly just curious what happened to the frames contests since the last few months of 2021. I've just passed. I do remember you switching animation jobs and other changes in your career very recently, but I still don't know if the contest got discontinued or just went on a break. I heard October would be an early contest date in 21 for a change, but even December already took place. That's correct. It's really my only question other than what your thoughts on stop motion. Okay, this is a different. Let's, let me go step by step. So first, um, I stopped teaching on-site classes at the Academy. Uh, I'm doing online only. Uh, and even then I'm scaling back. I'm actually, this is the first semester where I'm not teaching an animation mentor. 
because my new job, new responsibilities, new time and schedule, I'm scaling way back. And, uh, and one of the things was the academy. It was the academy for the on-site, which are still online. They're not, like the online, online classes are more flexible in terms of when I log in and check things. The on-site, which are online, are a three-hour block from 6 to 9 p.m. And I can't do that anymore because of my schedule with my current work. So how does that, um, what's the word, connect, I guess, uh, to, the, uh, to the contest? It used to be that we all come up, like, like all the students had to come up with three topics in their class, and this would be all like one ginormous class, Zoom, and and they would they would you know, we I would write down what their topics were, we would vote on them, and then vote what what until we just down to one. It was such a fun process. It was something so specific to the on-site class. That's how it started years ago, um, and now that it's gone, I don't know. Like I don't know. I'm wondering. I think it might just be on a break. I might bring it back. Sometimes it's a bit of a, a, a hassle with um, prizes because I don't want to bug the companies and you know, like ask for those things. It's always kind of like a favor thing. I feel kind of bad about that. So I thought let's do a new one where the prize is a workshop. You just get a free workshop, 16 submissions. Uh, so the price is uh, $4.99 basically is your, is your prize. <clears throat> but then again, time and issues. And the last time I did something where I put in the name of uh, someone who submitted something and they asked to not put the name in there. And I was on autopilot putting things in and I forgot that a person asked to not have their name in there. And I did by accident and I got a really nasty email from that person. And it really pissed me off. And I know it was my fault and I apologize, but that it went into like, you're doing this on purpose because you want my name to be out there because you want me blacklisted in companies and you're doing things and it got into like crazy conspiracy of, I don't know what's going on in that person's head. Uh, you know, they must have dealt with some some bad experiences and then projecting that on me. It was literally just, I mean, I was an idiot. I was in autopilot copy paste mode and did not read the email. It says, please don't use my name. Um, I think that they put in a, a nickname or something. It's just, there's a lot that happened the last time that kind of soured me on the whole process. But it is fun. And I know some people have gotten jobs through through winning those um so i don't know i think right now i would say they're on the break and again i want to look at my current schedule because everything including the work uh, the the channel maybe if, if you're a frequent watcher you're seeing how um some things are not as frequent anymore like uh product reviews and rig reviews and there's some other stuff that just, it takes a lot of time or fnas all that takes time and i just have to always weigh that in compared to um obviously family work and teaching these are the three blocks that take up most of the time that where i want to always focus on that and everything after that is just a eh, if i want to if i have time which includes the channel the channel is not something i need to do um it's not my job you know what I mean like it's uh, to me that's what i love about my channels was i it's i'm in charge of the schedules i can just do whatever i want on there and i just have to look at where i need to scale a few things back it's a long answer but i just want to give you the honest answer of what's going on um the other one here is what are your thoughts on stop motion animation uh, and if you have any advice how can i apply acting analysis tips and tricks to my work before okay, we'll do two different things hold on what are your thoughts on stop motion well i love it i love watching it i think it's insane what they do uh it just blows my head off in terms of the skill set and and they can just go like they have to go through it once they have maybe like if if they use that the the onion skinning for a frame before um, I think it's absolutely bananas what they do. It's just, I have so much respect and I tried it once and I'm, I'm doing a little stop motion with my little one. Uh, we started a, we bought the, oh, I bought it. He didn't buy it. He's nine. I bought the Kevin Perry class, had to go through stop motion. I'm sitting with my little one. We're going through that class. Like we just started, we haven't gone too far into it. Um, but yeah, he loves it and I want to do it. And, and it, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's insane to me. So I love it. And, um, it, I always feel like when a stop motion movie comes out, they're awesome, the technique is great, and it never does as well as CG movies in terms of box office, which doesn't drive enough of you know revenue, which which would you know um, provide funding for more movies. It's just, I always feel like underappreciated, maybe not by animators. I think we all know how hard it is and how awesome it is, but I think by the general public, there's something where just stop motion isn't taking off as much. I don't know. It's a bit, kind of a bummer. Uh, then is another one. 
How can I apply acting analysis tips and tricks to my work before possibly purchasing animation critiques from the Spongella workshop you still run? Well, I mean, it would just be... I mean, it depends. I mean, it depends how you learn. Like, my my hope and my thoughts are in terms of the acting analysis clips, um, which to me are, and I say this in every Q&A, whenever someone asks me, besides the FNAs, which are lectures, the, the acting analysis tips are the cornerstone of my channel, and they are the least watched clips. They even have less views than my monthly um, summary <laughs> clips, which cracks me up. But the thing is, with acting... Like, once you're past the technical aspect of animation, it comes all down to your ideas and performances and creativity. And the Act Analysis Tips series is there to show you examples of what people have done, like usually super talented actors. And you take that idea and obviously tweak it. You don't want to copy it. But it's, like I always say, a springboard for ideas. Like how would you use props? How would you use the camera? How would you use mechanics? How would you use acting, looking at people? There's so much stuff you can get. Like, I love analyzing movies and TV shows. It gives me a ton of idea, ideas that I, will, that I can give to my students. And this is not coming from an ego point of view, but I'm slightly shocked that they don't have more views because to me, they're really important. Like, if you are past the technical aspect and you're in the idea realm as an animator, then this series is for you. This is for you, just a, a, a well of knowledge, not for me, but from professional animators who do this for a living, who are really good. And to me, every animator should be, they arrogant, but I feel like they should be watching this because a lot of times for students, the ideas are where they struggle. Like the ideas are just kind of, and it doesn't make the shot that interesting. And then I always point them towards that series and go, look at all those movies and TV shows. There's so many ideas you can pick and choose from and mix and match. So uh, that's my long rant about, I'm, I'm curious why their views are so low. Maybe the presentation is horrible, <laughs> could also be. But I feel like besides the lectures, they are so important because they are the idea creation for a shot. But maybe my viewership is more on the, you might also say, which is someone someone once told me, is that these clips are a bit more advanced. And maybe my viewership is more on the, tutorial like how do you do a bouncing ball how do you do body mechanics and polish kind of like more technical and maybe less acting that could also be it um and that's like my long answer not answering your question because how can you apply it? it all i can say is watch it and you can always email me and ask questions like how like your idea how could you apply maybe something you watch specifically to your idea to me it's just i know i to be honest i don't have a good answer like how can you apply it before taking the workshop it's watch it, write down the ideas and principles behind the shot. I did one with uh, about the movie Emma, where, for instance, someone is drinking something and someone is trying to mimic them because they want to be as sophisticated as they are. And the idea out of that for me was, it's cool to have two people doing the same action, but one person is mimicking the other and they want to be as good as the other one. So you can see, you can you, the idea for me is that you do one action confidently and the other character is doing the same thing, but horribly. That would be a really fun contrast. So that's what that would be my answer. You you look at what I talked about. You look at what's the idea behind it, and then apply that to your shots. I don't know if that answers the question. I hope so. And finally, have you heard of the Animation Guild run by Howard Wimhurst? Wimhurst. I believe I do follow him on on YouTube. And do you have any ideas for possibly collaborating with them in the future? Okay, maybe not. I thought he's a two D guy. I don't know how I would uh, collaborate. They mostly are 2D natured animation, kind of like how the 3D natured my environment has been with your own community, but it's also all forms of animation included. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm If it's the one that I think of is so more advanced, uh, I don't know. Like this is That's a whole different area, 2D animation stuff that he's doing. Um, I don't know. I highly doubt he's watching my channel. But uh, Howard, if you're watching, Let's collaborate. I don't know. I don't know what we could do. It could be interesting. Maybe we could do... Actually, we could do something... Hmm. Okay. Just had an idea. I'm going to write this down because my uh, my brain is horrible. So this is going to be extremely boring to watch. Basically, what I'm going to do is... How about I fold this into a quick uh, tip? Write everything down. <laughs> so collaborate with Howard... Wimhurst, and I'm going to write down my idea. Wait, I'm not going to say out loud. And then that's it. 
the reason why I'm typing this and you're watching this is because actually I do this all the time. This is like, this is like a separate thing of whenever I have an idea, I either observe something, someone did something cool. I saw a cool shot in a movie in terms of composition or a cool camera move idea or anything. I write it down and I've, and I put this, I think I talked about, I, I think I know I talked about this before, but I have my idea blog where, which is private, where I just post all that stuff. I can write an email that automatically posts it on that blog. So you have a timestamp. Uh, or I post it manually and I have my animation reference, uh, composition reference or animation idea or character idea, little tags. And it's an ongoing thing. And I write this out all the time, just like my acting analysis clips. I have a separate thing of just general ideas. This could be a, a, an awesome drawing I saw with the character. Like, oh, that's a cool idea of framing or multiple characters being together. Um, and I highly recommend you do that. Like you have a an area where you can collect your ideas um which goes back to you should always observe which goes back also to the acting analysis clips you, you watch this and you think about those ideas and then you combine that with something you just observe so it's more original right you take an idea but make it your own so i don't i always observe i always write stuff down it's always fun to see certain things especially with a family uh outside a kid dog like anything there's always something where you go like oh that was a cool idea how could i put this into um my animation and i've shown it before actually i have it on my phone as well because I've done another one I have um because when I left ILM I was going to start a new demo reel and I had a couple demo reel ideas and here are you can you can see what is this breathe okay this is a shot that I started that I never finished whoa <laughs> the camera the camera lost my face and went what is going on all right how about this can you just focus it's too bright can't see it it's too bright Anyway, it's going to go crazy. Can it adjust? It can't. Anyway, but you saw all this and I can go down and scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll to here. And these are all separate shots that I want to do for demo reel. So I should probably put these on my blog as well. But it's basically the blog one is just separate ideas and very wishy-washy mixed and stuff. And then I have this that are very specific. Oh, that's a shot I want to do for a demo reel specifically, which is outside of a shot that I just recently did that was kind of redoing a, a meme. The, oh no, I broke my table, which is doing fairly well. This is that's a series that I had in mind and it tells me that I should probably continue. 411,000 views and you can, I don't know if you can see the graph. I'm gonna hold my camera down. How about this? You can see this here. That graph is going up and up and up and just had a spike again. I don't know why. But it's just something that is an idea that I had uh, for just for myself. It's such a ramble answer to your question. Uh, it's basically I want to do the ambitious plan was to do a shot a month, which is uh, probably a shot every two months. I want to do it in January, but I got COVID uh, Omicron over New Year's Eve. So like the 28th or 9th or so I got I'm sick, really sick for a day. And then two days later, I was fine, but then just had a cough. And that kind of, but it still threw me off and it's throughout the schedule. I had to stay isolated. It just, it changed everything. That's why when, if you look at my channel during that time, there wasn't much posted because I was isolated in my room. Oh, but anyway, I thought it would be kind of cool to do a shot a month, two months that are really short. Like the, oh no, I broke my table is really short. There's not much to do in terms of animation, but I had a bunch of props and stuff. I don't want to do a shot that is every month, something new, maybe a different render or a different idea or something. Um, as a constant practice thing. I don't even know why I mentioned this. Oh, this goes back into the acting analysis that is constantly on my mind, where I want to use those ideas and apply that stuff to my own shots instead of just talking about them. Anyway, such a long answer. But I'm going to see you about Howard. I don't know. I feel like I'm beneath him. And why would he collaborate with me? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I'm not against collaboration. It would be awesome. Anybody watching, uh, let's collaborate. Let's do something fun. It's always fun to do something with people. Um, and I think that's it. Yes. Thanks in advance, JD. Hope you and everyone else, students, clients, <laughs> animators have a great 2022 year. I agree. Tony Cashman, the insightful. That was the longest answer I think I've ever given. Maybe. Then we have H3RCM. I don't know what that means. What do you do when your student is struggling to learn, even if you are giving your best to teach him? Yes, that was my last semester at the academy. I'm going to out them. Sorry. Um, 
Because Academy is different than Animation Mentor. Animation Mentor has very focused students. They know what they want to do, and that's they just want to do animation. It's and I usually have class six, which is the demo reel class, where we do some acting stuff and kind of re rejiggle some shots in their in their on their reel. So more advanced students. The Academy is like all over the place, where it can be. They just got there. They're grad. They're about to graduate. They are changing majors, and this goes from people who are struggling with bouncing balls to people who are great at acting clips. It really, is, is a. This is also why I like it because it has that range. It's interesting to work with that. And then sometimes you have um, students who are just really, really struggling um, to a point where sometimes you just there's nothing you can do anymore. It's basically when I see a shot, their specific class, and the shot is really not working. Then I and and what I do then is I go backwards in terms of the complexity level. So if there's like last semester, there were a few people that had really they were struggling with acting shots to a point where it wasn't even acting; it was just the mechanics were really really lacking. So then I scale back. So then I tell her, listen, let's just not focus on lip sync all that stuff. Let's just do just a mechanics pantomime shot and just really cut it to just a couple seconds. I plead with them. Again, they're paying for the class. Ultimately, it's up to them. I can just only guide them. But I, I, I really emphasize that they should keep the shot short. And then if it still doesn't work, it's like, all right, let's go back to a sit down. That's usually my default um, mechanic shot. Sit down, really exaggerated. You're sitting down, the impact on the body, overlap with the head, just to, to show weight, impact, and drag overlap in the spine and the head. It's not realistic whatsoever, but it's, it's a more mechanics thing. And if that doesn't work, which I had two or three, which still didn't work, I literally went back to bouncing ball. And then two out of the three, the bouncing balls were okay. I mean, not the best thing ever, but okay. The weight is there and the timing is there. And then I went back to just, you know, like arm movements, head moves, sit down again. It's kind of really building like small building blocks. And then one person is still struggled with the bouncing ball. And then it was clear that that person maybe shouldn't have passed the previous classes or they just really struggle with the basics of timing and spacing. So when my long answer, I will go backwards and uh, reduce the complexity of a shot until you can figure out what the problem is. And in that person's case, it was basic timing. It was the timing of the bounce wasn't there. The arcs were messy. Um, there was not enough weight on the roll and stop. There's just the basics just weren't there. And then it's, and that's not, it's not wrong. Like, you know, if, if someone rushes through assignments or if a teacher gives them, you know, good grades and just passes them, they, they will never know. And if you are a student watching this and you're struggling with this and you, you were told by someone, hey, let's scale back and do something. That's not like, don't take this personally or as a hit on your ego or something. It's just, you have to start with the basics and then they have to be really, really good. And then you move on and that has to be really, really good. And then you move on because once you're in performance, you can't worry about the mechanics and weight and all that stuff because you have to focus on performance, which is so difficult already. So if you're struggling with mechanics while you're doing performance, just that's a recipe to just many, many headaches. So if you're struggling, just know when teachers ask you to scale down or do something simpler, it's really so that also they can see where you're at. And maybe you feel like I can do bouncing ball and maybe you can. But if you can, then what? It took you, what, 10 minutes? It's not It's not going to take you long to do the bouncing ball if you can do it. So just, you know, don't think of it in terms of an ego hit. Just like, all right, well, let me just do a 10-minute bouncing ball here. It's awesome. And then the teacher knows, oh, okay, well, that works. How about the next complex assignment to see where your problems are? Does that make sense? I hope that answered it. As always, that's my hope. Trog Joe. I don't know. I know the pronounces, but it, it's written Trog Joe was listening to a podcast with Disney feature animators. They were casually dropping that six months of OT, six days a week work is the norm. Is that industry standard at, or is that industry standard all feature animation shops? I'm adding the at. Cause screw that, I'll stay in indie games where I've been 16 years and rarely crunch more than two weeks. <laughs> well, it would be quite the change to do uh, 16 years of indie games and then to uh, Disney feature. Um, but why not? Sounds kind of cool. So I see here three replies. I replied to that before because the podcast was the animation happy hour, which I did that recommendation for. I highly recommend it. It's a great podcast. Um, from what I hear, I don't work at Disney. I mean, I used to I used to work at ILM, which was owned by Disney. So I don't, but I haven't worked at Disney feature. But from what I hear is that there is a you know a long process of, of getting the story right. And then at the end is a big chunk of animation that has to be done, which... From what I hear, like DreamWorks has a 
they did crunch as well but they have a more relaxed schedule where it's not all compressed it's a bit more stretched out so there's less ot this is really all hearsay um so basically my answer is i i'm not surprised i'm not surprised like you know it's it's so much work that they do uh there might be something where a story gets completely reworked towards the end and then they're late with animation it can happen um i don't know if it's really six days a week for six months for every movie i highly doubt that i highly doubt that um that would be tough though so what i if, if you're curious about that i would find people who actually work there <laughs> and ask them uh and just generally ask people at companies if you can or you know maybe google around maybe if someone in an interview said something like who knows uh maybe some people don't want to admit how long things take i remember working on force awakens and force awakens had 11 months of saturdays 11 months i think so but also there it's like we get so taken care of or not i'm not an ilm anymore but you know you got you have your lunches your breakfast your dinners um and it was never for that movie it was never brutal because because it's not all it wasn't mandatory you just come in if you can so and i loved it and it was okay i talked to my wife like the whole schedule worked out that uh i ended up doing a bunch of saturdays and i don't remember that it was i just i just thought the production coordinator came and said hey did you know that we're doing this for 11 months now that's probably a massive exaggeration, but I remember it being a long time and us not even realizing it because we had so much fun. Working Force Awakens was so much fun. So it really all depends on how do you deal with OT? You know, what is your OT? Is it nine hours? Is it 12 hours? Is it like ILM has every two, if we have OT or when I used to have OT, uh, like if you come in two Saturdays, the third Saturday, you have to take off. It's mandatory unless the show, you know, is in crazy trouble and you just have to do multiple Saturdays. But usually is you you take the third Saturday off at least to get back to, you know, work-life balance. Even if you work, you, know, you couldn't work longer than 12 hours a, uh, a day. Because again, they don't want you to overwork and go home tired. Um, if you're tired, you can order an Uber and they pay for the Uber. Um, I don't know if they're still doing that, but that was something that, that was for a while. Um, like they're really, really concerned about OT and they really try not to. And it's... I don't know, like the last couple of years, I really didn't have that much OT. Dare I say, for me at least, on the shows that I was on, the the crunch and the OT was really well managed. And it's, you know, when it happens like, hey, we need help, can you help out? And, you, and then sometimes you say, no, I can't. I got stuff to do, I can't. And then go, okay. And then they find someone else or they don't. And then they, they rejiggle things. And production was always on top of things. I don't know, I have only the highest praise in terms of um, production in San Francisco, I don't know about you know other hubs, but or other you know like London or whatever. But um, for me, it was never. It was one show that was brutal, which shall not be named. It's years and years and years ago. But even then, it wasn't mandatory. I remember them asking, "Can you can you help out? It's going to be pretty brutal, but we need help." And then again, talked to my wife, schedule kits and everything. And then it was my choice. And I said, okay, let's do this. And then it was a very specific choice to work really long hours for a really long time, mainly because it was really good money. It was OT is time and a half. And I, I made a bunch of money that year, thanks to that show. So it was really it was really a, um, a personal choice. I don't know. But if you're at a company where they force you and it's mandatory and they give you crap for it, then yeah, screw that. And that's not, that's not how you want to go through your day job all the time. I say it is maybe you don't have the choice or the possibility to change right now, but just know that that's not normal. If you're constantly in OT and forced to do that, and maybe it's even like where they don't pay you, stuff like that, just not right. Anyway, but that's me again, like from Ivory Tower talking, you know, without problems, whatever. Anyway, I'll leave it at that. Uh, and if you have fun doing indie games for 16 years, I don't know. <laughs> Sounds great to me. Don't, don't change that. Medo Adele is asking, I can listen to JD, JD all day. I can't even pronounce my own name. JD, I was almost French here. I can listen to JD all day. He's just a likable, great content too. It's not even a question. Well, thank you, Medo. Medo, Medo, I don't know. But thank you. That's a very uh, nice uh, comment there. Thank you so much. Dragon Skunk Studio is asking, you have a long list on IMDb and was wondering, what published cinematic work of yours are you particularly proud of the most? Cinematic work. Um, it's a good question. I don't know. I mean, I really like what I did on Space Jam 2. Um, 
but those were character tests and they no one will ever see those because they are they're tests and they're not they're not out there uh yeah that's my i really I was, it was so much fun working on those tests it was for the character pete and uh i would say that's probably that's probably my answer there i do like the stuff that i did on force awakens i like star wars in general that was a lot of fun i like doing stuff like that there um stuff in star trek was great too um star trek in general i love so i'm always kind of i don't say i'm happy with my work but I, I just like working on that a lot um i don't know to me it's always i look back and i just see things that i want to fix so i don't know if i'm if i'm really <laughs> that proud although i like the stuff that i did for the um hunt the hunt uh, that was the uh the star wars cinematic for the game um that was specific for the cinematics for the game i like there was some cool facial stuff that i did that i liked a lot there i say so probably that and then i'll probably all, all go all the way back to episode three there i say there's a shot of obi-wan jumping out of the ship even though the camera's crazy and the jump at the very beginning is too fast um but i like the tumble and that i still like that shot it's like one of my first shots 18 years ago uh and i still like it and there's another one with with anakin hitting obi-wan's ship and all the buzz droids fall off i still like those there i say um i don't know a super fond memory of my my very first show anyway i hope that answers the question what are we at here 47 minutes we'll continue for an hour maybe smoky does bear <laughs> i love those names are great this is a three-part question okay hold on here's a read more tab this is a three-part question okay more or less related to the technical side of animation going to try and keep them short one I'm still learning about rig controls, so I was looking for resources on FK, IK, spine, torso controls, and their best case use. Like, when should you use one control over the other? This can also apply to arms, feet, head, neck controls, but I'm more focused on the spine, torso. That's a good question, just because I am personally not a fan of um, spine and torso controls where you have like six controls on them. Uh, and this is mainly because I'm used to ILM rigs where we have one control that move this in ik and fk mode and then we had an inner control that would move it really separate where it would not affect uh, shoulders and arms um and you can you can translate move it you can really you can get some nice pose in your spine without being overwhelmed with the amount of controls sometimes when i work stuff uh, on my own shots at home and you got like five controls and like i try to reduce the controls to maybe two here to get that collapsing of the of the chest um because again the, the rib cage can only collapse so much you can go back a bit more but there's only so much you can do and then you got the stomach area where it can really collapse but this is fairly more static than the than the stomach area so i try to limit to two controls if you have, if there are too many or or, or constrain when i put a locator and constrain a bunch of look um, controllers to one i just want to keep it a bit more just simpler in terms of the the torso control um but i'm also doing everything ik i can't even imagine that's something else i want to do which i talked about before about my monthly shots i want to do a shot all in fk because i haven't done fk in forever i can't even imagine doing fk arms um maybe rigs are better nowadays but they, there's so much that happens that screws up your fk arm arcs in terms of even 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 with space switching i don't know i have i have not i'm not looking forward to it, but i do want to go through that but anyway that would be my tip i would simplify and this goes like you said for other rigs this goes for anything when you start a shot i would use the least amount of controls then you, it, you have a much easier time to edit things and once you're done and you're polished then you can start adding all those extra channels and things that will add that you know the extra flourish so it's not so it doesn't get too complicated with your curves and your graph editor and, and your keys that would be my my tip there relate to Related to the previous question, but I'm also a bit confused about world local space, when to use one or the other. For example, how in some controls, like say the knee or foot, have a space switch for the hips, cock, root, and foot. So it's like if you have an arm and, it's, and, the, and the space switch is to world, you move your body, your arm is going to stay put like an, I, uh, an FK or IK um, control. But you can have an IK control where the, the space is, let's say the cock, the center of gravity, your root, then you can move depending on how the rig is set up but you can move the chest and then the arm is still stuck in space because it's separate but when you move the root your arm goes with you 
So it's basically you want to decide if the head, arms, whatever you have is following a certain thing and you want it to be everything, you know, everything following like, like FK wise like this. Do you want the head to be staying put so you don't have to counter animate all the time? So if that's what the, the, the spaces are. Um, and you can you know, key them on and off. It's, it's, I think it's super helpful. Uh, I'm not, I don't do a huge amount of space switching because I didn't have to at work. It was kind of okay. But again, it's something just like animating in steps that I haven't done too much, um, too much with, but um, English escapes me. So that's one, that's one thing I want to do for sure. Um, but that would be my answer. It really depends on what you want to do. Like, you know, like knees, maybe you have something where, not that it would, well, I wouldn't use a space switch for that, but it, some, some rigs have a pin control. So that when you have your, your knee on the table, you would pin that. So when you move around, that knee is not sliding around. Um, so it's kind of the same idea that was with space switching where you want to decide what your body part is following. If that makes sense. Three, are there things or subjects outside animation, but in the production pipeline that you would recommend that animators should learn, such as learning about rigging or scripting? It doesn't have to be in-depth knowledge, but just learning little bits and pieces that could help in your workflow. Good question. Depends on your interests and your long-term goals. Meaning, I am interested in character performance and acting and story and directing. Like I would love to direct something in, in the future. So for me, my outside interest in terms of um, just animating like the, the performance and physically, you know, the, the body mechanics basically, um, would be a lot more about acting and performance, hence the acting analysis series which also goes then into composition, where to place your characters, and then cameras. How does the camera feel and change the mood, the way a character is framed, and then into editing and sound designers, anything that goes into more, how could you do like a, like a sequence, a short or previs or post vis on your own in terms of telling a story. That would be my, that's my focus at least. Um, for you, a rigging can be great, right? If you're more technically inclined and you want to be able to animate something and the rig is not doing what you want it to do and you can fix it on your own because you know rigging that's great too if you're on a team and the rigging department is slammed they can't give you updates fast enough you could do a proxy rig to help out your team to get stuff moving to do some tests until um, rigging can catch up you know that's that would be uh, something that would be great scripting would be great too if you, could, if you can help out the team or yourself with tools that'd be great um yeah i mean there's there's a bunch of stuff like that Simulations, if you want to break stuff apart and, you know, like explosions or debris or something, um, that could be great for, for previous if you're doing something action-y and you can help out in that aspect. Uh, it just, it really all depends on your, um, yeah, field of interest and what you want to do. For me, it's just performance. I love camera stuff. I love composition. And, and for me, I want to go more into that type of thing. Even like color, color design and stuff like that to get like a, a finished look and even like renders like that's why i did that um oh no the table is broken because i wanted to try let's try renders that was an arnold render i want to try there's all the other different renders and, and and stuff like that so i don't know hopefully that answers your question you're at 54 minutes do some more i don't think i'm gonna do i have so many questions this is going to be part one i'm definitely gonna do a part two um and i don't know if i should do it longer than an hour q a comment if you can listen to my Swiss, French, English voice uh, for longer than an hour. All right. Fires, Firestorm, Storm. Is that misspelled? Should it be Firestorm? I don't know. Any advice on someone who's done a more, a more of realistic animations based off reference, but wants to get into more cartoony stylized animations? I am a beginner animator, but not sure where to start. Thank you. Well, what is kind of like where... That's always kind of my wheelhouse where I do uh, realistic animation full time as a job and then teaching cartoony, even though now my new job is cartoony um, performance. So it's a good question. I think what I would do is what I would, would uh, recommend anybody do that either switches or starts off new, you being a beginner or, and, and switching, would be look at the style that you're interested in because the cartoony stuff there are different ways where you can do super snappy to more naturalistic like there 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 are different levels to cartoony so for me it would already be identify for yourself 
your level of interest or your, your focus. I want to be more like this or like that or like that. You can't say all of it because, again, you're going to be overwhelmed. Pick one and then you can go into other realms later. Then if you have decided something, then I would do uh, a deep dive into reference where look at the things that you really like within that style and create a bit of a demo reel of the best things you you you, you like. For instance, um, I started the series and it's so time consuming. That's why I haven't continued yet. But I have a whole list of things. I think Wolfwalker is going to be next as well as uh, Spider-Verse. It's a series called So Good where I don't just, and it's not really analyzing. It's just, it's a compilation of shots I really like from a movie or a TV show. And that's what I would recommend. It's also why I'm doing it because it gives me a, a good list of reference clips if I need something to look at to, to study on my own because I need to get better at those things. So I will look at a movie or TV show, do a best of reels of the best shots, and then study that. Study the timing, the composition, the poses, the everything. And then you do, again, two to three second short shots. Practice, not not 20 second lip sync thing. Go short with mechanics and the style, because you got to practice the spacing and the style of the animation, the cartoon animation you want to do. So that would be that would be my answer. Hope that helps. Underscore wild underscore is asking the best and the worst shot that you worked on. In terms of fun, what shot did you enjoy the most? Spend your time on. Did you enjoy the most spending your time on? I guess and the shot that rather rework on you prefer go time mine coal. I don't know what that means. I hope the question makes sense. P.S. I love your video, especially the trail analysis. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to extract the questions from what I think they mean. So the best shot that you worked on. Again, I got to I got to go back to Space Jam 2 and it's kind of like a cheap. It's, it's a it's a, a way out of. Oh, that was the best I've ever done, but no one will ever see it. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a cheap way. Um, I don't know if it was the best one. I just know I had so much fun doing it. Other than that, it actually goes back to what I said before. It's a couple of shots, like a lot of. I've done so many Star Wars movies, and it's probably that is the 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 pool of shots that I look back on fondly. Sounds kind of weird. Um, Rango was fun, but didn't work too much on that movie. But that was fun too. Harry Potter was fun. I wouldn't say my shots were great, but it was fun to work on because it was within that world and franchise. Um, I don't know, like Transformers has a bunch of shots. I always feel like they're not good enough. Tough shows, but you learn so much. It was always great. Um, I don't know. It's hard to choose. Right now, I would say just those P tests. I wish that one day they would be online. And then you'll watch them and you go like, they're not good at all. But for me, um, the worst shot that I worked on it says here in terms of fun and this and this and the this time you spent on the shot you would rather we work. I don't I think the worst shot. I don't know. There's so many. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, it's it's easy to go back to episode three because it was my first show. Uh, I did a uh, a flying creature cycle. It's my first time ever doing a creature. First time ever doing a flying cycle. Uh, I don't think it's it's because it's so fantasy in Star Wars. You might get away with, ah, I guess that's how they move. But in terms of flight dynamics and, and, and wing shapes and everything, not a fan <laughs> looking back. Um, I don't know. There's a bunch of stuff. I remember there's a shot in Transformers where Optimus Prime, I think it's Transformers 4, where he rolls back. He's, he's on the on the street, rolls back, and then lands in this hero pose, <sighs> sliding down. And the next shot is the foot slamming into a car. I remember liking that one. And I just recently looked at it. And I don't like it anymore. I thought there's something in the timing that's really off. And it's so weird because, I mean, obviously in the movie, if people thought it was good enough. And I, I thought it was, one day in the future, I'm going to use that shot on my reel because I really like it. And then when I recently looked at when I was, you know, doing my reel as I was leaving ILM, I was looking at that shot and went, that shot's not good. <laughs> I don't know. To me, that's my main experience. I look back at my shots and go, that's not good. I don't know. I don't know if I would have done it uh, this time. I don't know. I don't know if that makes sense. But uh, I think it's, I'm always very critical. And it's, it's I, sometimes you also do a shot and you think it's okay. And maybe in the back of your head, you go, I want it to be okay because I'm tired of the shot. Uh, and then it's okay. And then years later, you look back and you go, mm, it's not that good. I don't know. To me, that's probably my the majority of my shots where I feel like mm, maybe not that good. And the best would be, 
I still like those two shots, like I said before, from episode three uh, all the way back. And uh, yeah, the Space Jam ones. I don't know. Still like those. Anyway, Thomas Animations. Hold on. There's a read more. How long is this? Okay, that's just it. Hello, JD. Hello. I am 19-year-old self-taught animator. Lots of 19-year-olds here who's been animating for about four years now. That's a long time. You started young. That's awesome. I look at professionals every day, and while that gets me excited to improve it, also makes me very insecure when working on my animations. I can get that, but don't feel bad about that. I keep thinking about my future as an animator, jobs, and I feel overwhelmed by questions that makes me overall insecure. At the moment, I just want to study animation at this online school, Anim School. That's quotation also in brackets, Anim School. And hopefully I'll be able to grow and become more sure of myself. For now, do you have some suggestions for someone young like me who has never had working experiences and feels scared for his future as an animator, but at the same time excited because passionate about his job? My first reply is, it's completely normal to feel that way. And that's not going to help you. Because <laughs> um, I have the same thing. I've done this, like I said, for 18 years now. Or since, I mean, I've been animating, what, at school, 22, since almost from animating the first time, so 20 years that I've been animating. Um, and I see stuff online just, just a couple days ago. So I was like, oh my God, this is so good. Can I do this? I don't think I can do this. That's my my daily experience going on LinkedIn, seeing people's work, going on Twitter, seeing people's work. Um, I don't know. It's always kind of like that mixture of, this is awesome. How cool is that? Damn, I have so much to learn. Should I even try? but it's really exciting and motivating. Let's try it. I think that's kind of, that's my up and down um, path. And I think it feels like you're kind of in that same realm. I think it's okay to be overwhelmed just because it's, you are new. Just also be patient with yourself. Just know that you are at that place where you're, you're new, you're doing stuff, you're self-taught, you haven't had experience yet at a company or somewhere, you know, whatever your work experience definition is. So feeling like that is completely normal. And just know that as you're going to keep on working, you will build on top of your experiences and um, what's it called? Uh, confidence. Because you're going to do something that you've never done before. That's completely normal. Everybody goes through something where I've never done this. Let me try it out. And you might do a, a horrible job at it. And that's going to like it's going to be a hit in terms of confidence and doing it again. But what I would take from that is just, just try to find out why it didn't work out and what you can learn from that. Because the best way to learn is to make mistakes. So if something doesn't work out, I don't see it as, oh my God, that's a failure. I should never do this again. I'll go, that was really not good. Why? What did I do wrong? I did this, this, and this wrong. Let me take that and now focus on this to make this better so it doesn't happen again. That would be my process. And then you do it again. And then it, it's good. You go, well, there you go. I can do it. And that goes into your, your first Lego block of confidence. And then you go through different shots. Like I said before, try so, as many different things as you can so that your experience is vast so that you did humans, but young humans, uh, old, skinny, bigger, you know, kids, um, creatures, big creatures, small creatures, land creatures, flying creatures. Try everything small chunks so you don't get overwhelmed but the more you do the more you can take all the separate pieces and combine that into a new shot so that when you get a new shot you just you're not overwhelmed because you you can go oh i've done this before the ideas have to be new and creative but from a technical point you've done this before it's going to be okay i don't know if that helps you but it's kind of like a rehash of a previous answer but that's kind of how i approach things and how it has worked for me doesn't mean it works for you but that's how i would Try it at least and see how that works for you. So I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be scared just because you're self-taught. That's already a lot of discipline. That's already better than a lot of other people. Uh, you've been doing this for four years, so you got the drive to continue, um, and you're asking all the right questions, and you are in tune with your feelings and and your outlook of things, and you know like how your your humility and motivation level is. I, I think you're on the right path. Um, and it's and it's going to be a struggle. I mean, I'm not going to lie. It's going to be a struggle starting out, and then it's going to get better. And maybe that struggle also lasts longer than, than other people, and then it's going to get better. Like who knows? It's also very very subjective and personal. But um, I think you're just going to be okay. And again, my advice for you would be just: it's okay to feel scared. I still feel scared, and 
the way to overcome that is to try different things so that like for instance i haven't done um cycles in a really really long time and for the current project i'm on uh i want to do cycles i need to do cycles so i'm slightly nervous i know i can do it but a cycle doesn't come as easy as like a body mechanics jump land action thing or a performance thing it's just something i haven't done in a long time so i feel like you're like slightly scared but then deep down i go but i've done it before and i know how to animate it's going to be okay the question is how good is it going to be i don't think it's gonna be a failure but i take that as being like i try to take something like this where you're quote unquote scared and turn that into excitement i'm just i might be nervous but i can go oh this is going to be cool because i have i saved so many tutorials about mechanics acting cycles like i have a look at my email that's open here i have folders with so many different things over the years that i've kept for my students but also for myself now i can dive into all those tutorials and classes and go this is going to be really cool because at the end of this whole process i'm going to come out being a better animator because now i know this better than before so i try to take those nervous or scared aspects and turn that into this is an opportunity to get better I'm excited. I know it's a bit of an unknown, but it's going to be really cool. I don't know. It works for me. It doesn't mean it works for you, but that would be my my advice. Where are we at? An hour and seven minutes. I'm going to do one more only because it says, hey, JD, first of all, happy new year to you and your fam. Is there a question? Oh, it's a long one. Okay. I'm going to stop there. And that's Thai Young Man. <laughs> that's, the, that's the username. I don't know. So Thomas Animations. That's the last one. Uh, Thai Young Man, you're going to be the next one. And if I scroll up, there are a bunch of questions. All of you guys are awesome because you ask a bunch of questions. They're the great questions too. I see three parts. There I say. And I've, what I'm probably going to do, I put this on a Friday for like an FNA Friday type of thing. What is it? Um, it's late. So I said to check the time. Uh, I can hear in the thing. It's Sunday, by the way. I'm going to check. I don't want to abandon my family for too long here. Um, I'm going to stop here. Like I said, I'm gonna, this is probably going to be three parts. And I'm assuming I can't see into the future, but I want to post it on a Friday as kind of like an FNA replacement. But with three parts, I don't want to do, I don't want to skip FNAs for three or four weeks. So. I'm going to post this on that Friday and I'm probably going to post them on like a Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday, part two and three, maybe there's a four, uh, and then get back to FNAs on, on Fridays. Anyway, that's important to know, but I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you again to all of you who asked questions. They're really cool questions. I can't wait to answer all of them. Hopefully this was uh, informative and helpful, um, especially to those that I answered the questions. <laughs> um, comment, you know, maybe you need clarification on something or you have more questions, you know, that can always kind of swap into a part three, four, five, depending. My Usually my Q&A answers go into many, many parts. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Hopefully everything has been recorded. I mean, this is on my mic here, squeaky mic. Uh, an hour and 10. Uh, I got to cut some stuff out because of the dog. And uh, I think that's it. So part one, Q&A. Again, hopefully it was helpful. Questions, clarifications, comments, regrets, concerns. Leave them in the comment section. And that is that. Thank you. Until the next part, or if you're watching my, my channel in general, until uh, the next upload, feel free to subscribe. Of course, the pitch, like and subscribe, and all that good stuff if you like it. Uh, yeah, that's it. So thank you. Until the next clip.